So you're in for a real treat this afternoon. I am uh, blessed to be able to welcome Victoria Modesta here to the Victoria and Albert Museum for a very special Virtual Futures Salon. Uh, this event forms part of the V&A's Digital Design uh, Weekend, which is organized to coincide every single year with the London Design Festival. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of something called Virtual Futures. So for those who are here for the first time, Virtual Futures first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. It arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst it most, was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno-parties was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and even non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. Our Salon series here in London completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. For many of the folks in the audience, the, the individual sitting beside me needs no introduction. I first became aware of Victoria's work, as, as many of us did, uh, during the closing ceremony of the 2012 Olympics uh, here in London. Channel 4's uh, Superhumans campaign had done much to challenge the traditional views on disability, but there was nothing quite like the visceral image of the Snow Queen, complete with her uh, Zorokoski crystal-covered prosthetic leg to make that message really visceral. Suddenly, prosthetics were no longer about what was missing, but about what was actually there. I would end up meeting your, actually I'd end up meeting your legs before I had the chance to meet you uh, in person because I had the, um, the pleasure of meeting uh, Sophie um, in 2014, Sophie de Oliveira Barata at the Alternative Limb Project. Sophie's work is dedicated to uh, turning prosthetics into highly stylized art pieces and I'm sure we're going to hear more about your collaborations with Sophie and the long-term partnership she's had with you um, throughout the course of this afternoon. And it was on Sunday the 14th of December 2014, at the end of that year, when Victoria was reintroduced to the UK again on Channel 4, and uh, which gave her a national platform on which to share her vision for an alternative pop, uh, uh, as an alternative pop artist as part of Channel 4's Born Risky campaign, which is uh, part of the video that we've just seen. You see, beyond that, as far as I see it, and as far as all of the alumni at VF see it, um, you are truly a polymath. Uh, one who's dedicated her entire life to exploring the body and identity, and that's really what I want to unpick with you over the course of this afternoon. Victoria is a director, uh, director's fellow at the MIT Media Lab, a performance artist, a model, and according to the popular press, the world's first bionic pop star. <laughs> With the aid of advanced prosthetics, she challenges the term disability mm. and challenges society's uh, modern perception of physical beauty. As a musician, she's created a sound that's crafted through her performances in international uh, fashion and club events. And as an artist, she collaborates with designers, stylists, photographers, and prophetists to really push the envelope of art, fashion, and utility. And that was the reason why um, we asked Victoria here, right in the middle of London Design Festival here at the V&A. So, Victoria, over to you. That's who is, quite an introduction. Who is Victoria Modesta? Mm. Well, I think, for, I think... There are very few who don't know. I think you've definitely covered quite a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm, firstly, I'm really, really excited to be here in London because I don't get to do many things in London because I've been travelling a lot. But um, I think that, weirdly enough, being uh, part of the design festival is weirdly appropriate because I think that one thing for sure is that whether it's um, working in a performance, whether it's working on tech fashion or prosthetics, um, everything is incredibly design conscious in my sort of universe. And, and I think that the impact that it can have on an individual is still kind of, you know, I think, I really think that it's still being explored 
uh, properly now. So. I wonder if you could tell us, so there's a small subset of this audience who just mm. sort of wandered in because they got lost mm. in the V&A. Sure. Um, and they may not know who you are. I just wonder if you could tell us your, your story and everything that happened in 2007 that, that came you, Victoria Modesto. Sure. Um, so I've had a quite, um, quite dramatic um, sort of life. And I, I was born and uh, still in the USSR. And um, I ended up going through a kind of rather dramatic sort of health history of, um, of, of pretty much being kind of like a bit of an outcasted person in the USSR society where actually if you weren't completely healthy, they were very much considering you as someone who shouldn't even be alive. So I sort of went through um, a lot of very difficult, difficult things in order to, you know, that kind of made me face up and, and sort of go on a quest of searching who the fuck I was because gro being, um, being born in Latvia, having, um, having an accident during birth and going through lots of surgeries and having everybody literally look at you like, you know, we know exactly what you're going to be like when you grow up was very sort of character forming because, you know, if you're faced with a sense of like complete non-belonging and, and I don't mean like oh I mean to like I don't know um, goth music or something I mean like really like feeling like you don't even know where you can go within the society that you're in um, you know it was uh, it was definitely kind of uh, building blocks of, of, of sort of the, the quest but anyway and then in 99 I, I moved to uh, London with my parents and um, and went from one extreme environment of hospitals and pretty much weird, semi-isolated, non-real-like world um, into the, the depths of um, alternative London, which um, was actually the perfect platform for some experimentation. <laughs> and um, so anyway, and then by the age of 15, I was kind of already really into, um, uh, really into, uh, sort of performance art and quite avant-garde fashion and films and was really uh, quite heavily influenced by specifically the work of Matthew Barney and his uh, film that he, um, The Cycle of Queer Master, which he did with Amy Mullins, which happened to be um, a double amputee. And it's kind of weird that at the time, you know, going to clubs and, and, and really sort of experiencing experiencing the widest range of music and fashion and aesthetic and you know all the kind of crazy characters and how it all meant um, I think in that time I then sort of decided well you know I was kind of faced with a health issue that I couldn't really I had no idea how to move past that because my eyes were open to this new colorful world of creativity and so then from the age of 15, I was basically trying to um, voluntarily amputate my leg because um, it kind of, there was nothing else that they could really do for me. And so in that weird, weird sort of desperate time, I kind of realized that actually, um, you know, that was that, that taking ownership of your uh, body, which is actually kind of the only thing that we really properly own, <laughs> unless you're in some strange country. <laughs> um, you know, it, it was, yeah, it was definitely kind of like a, you know, a, a big sort of decision. But then when it came to five years later, I, when I was about 20, I finally was given this operation. And it's so weird that a very natural kind of um, survival situation that kind of forced me to, to do that actually landed me on a much bigger quest because you know by that point I really knew you know I was absolutely obsessed with everything that's got to do with design and aesthetic and the power of that everything from dressing up to conceptually how you can live your life differently and etc and but after mo after actually having to function um and, and merge my body with an artificial body part, it really kind of opened a question of like, well, you know, how much of me needs to be, how much of my physicality needs to be missing in order for me to still feel like me? And 
also, did it really change who I was? Um, because, you know, we, we have this feeling like this is, this is the map of who we are and this is our boundary and this is what makes us us and this like fleshy stuff is like the thing that really defines us, you know? And it definitely threw all of that out the window. And then I guess, um, you know, have, being so lucky, being part of, the, uh, part of a really, really diverse uh, creative culture, you know, it sort of became a bit of a lifetime project, really, where, you know, I really kind of just wanted to explore what it means to architect your own body and environment and things that are sort of happening to you, but, you know, on a quite precise sort of level. Um, and I think the important thing is, is that by the time you know, by the time that uh, the Paralympics were happening, I was still kind of an anomaly. I sort of walked around, um, I'd, I'd like do some photo shoots and stuff, and I'd already been into quite, you know, designer prosthetics, but I, and, and, and really quite avant-garde fashion. But at the time people, you know, I'd show up and people would be like, what is that? You know, how does that relate to anything? Like, it's this girl, she does this and, you know, and then the Paralympics happened and, I'm sure many of you watched the 2020 Paralympics, and and I was like, wow, I was like, you know, this global community. I'm like, hello. I'm like, you know, I'm going to meet you. I'm really excited, and I still felt like an anomaly. You know, I walked around in the diamond prosthetics, or you know, just being kind of in my character. But but it was really interesting how um, the the kind of the sort of confidence of just owning whatever the fuck you are and actually how you present that and being really comfortable with like manipulating things and just seeing like oh well, today i want to feel like this you know it really it seemed very shocking to the people that were sort of meeting me and you know a year year and a half down the line when prototype video came about it was supposed to be a national project <laughs> It's supposed to come out on, you know, just in UK, and it went like into a viral kind of thing, which, you know, which was weird because it kind of threw up a whole bunch of other questions. It's like, well, how, you know, is there such a need for this exploration of your body and identity with design and technology? and science that really fascinates people and maybe everybody is actually really wondering you know is this really who I am and you know how much I can change that and what it, what it all means you know so um, it's it, it's been a really strange transition and even then it was still just all about design only and aesthetic at that point there was definitely no technology or science that was particularly involved. It was very much like, you know, I had a dream and I was like thinking, right, you know, just think, think of stuff. You know, I'd often lie there in bed and design outfits or whatever that I wanted to wear on stage, but it was like, think of things that really make you excited. And I was like, right, I want to be a creature. I want, you know, I, I love high heels, but high heels are boring. I love point shoes, but point shoes are boring. I have the space to create something. Let's have a spike. And it was really simple. And yeah, it had this massive sort of impact. But it was definitely, it was definitely a start of experiencing how impactful design with your body can really be. I mean, everybody knows that if you wear a power outfit and you walk into the room, you know, just the way you change your silhouette, people react to you completely differently. But I think that was like, you know, I had a playground of doing something with my body that not many people get to do. You spoke about that redefining the boundaries of the body. When you met mm. Sophie at uh, the Alternative mm. Limb Project, how did that collaboration with her really help you explore different boundaries? Well, Sophie um, from the Alternative Limb Project is like the most magical, <sighs> wacky person you'll ever meet in your life. Like she'll sit there and her eyes will just pop of like, like what can we do? What material could we use? And like, you know, it, it really is like um, anything can happen. Well, she approached me very quickly after my operation actually, because 
she at the time was making um, realistic silicon skin in in like a normal sort of place for like arms and legs or whatever. And she was like, I, I'm looking to create something really weird. And mm -hmm. like most people would get offended, like an amputee out there in the, on the road, they'd just be like, you know, would you like me to make something weird for you? They'd probably, you know, and they maybe haven't dealt with it yet or whatever. So I was like, fantastic, let's do it. So she definitely, um, you know, I think she embodies the correct attitude towards design, actually, is that she's incredibly playful. She doesn't take it very seriously. Like, actually, her and I, it's like, no one takes this shit seriously. It is about, you can't, you can't do that because you have to allow whatever it is that you're designing to provoke some deep feelings in you and kind of, you know, it needs to be journey and stuff. So she's... She's really great like that. And she's definitely, she's been involved throughout the whole process. If you've never been to Sophie's studio, it is literally like a body shop. You, yeah. you walk in and she has a spectrum of skin. Um, <laughs> it's the first thing that hits you is the spectrum of all these different skin types because mm. she makes these very realistic limbs. But of course there's all these other types of prosthetics mm. that she makes. So Victoria, we spoke very briefly about it. I want to discuss this, this idea of prosthetic envy because what suddenly happens when people start seeing mm. images like that is they start going, oh my God, how do I get one? Mm. Able-bodied individuals, mm. if, if that's the right word, individuals mm -hmm. who have all the limbs go, oh, mm. how, do I, how do I get one of those spikes? Mm. And I've got amputee friends of mine who go, well, it's the most exclusive club in the world and it's going to cost you an arm <laughs> or a leg to get in, mate, so you pick. There's one way of getting in. <laughs> Some of them are in the audience. But I, I just wonder, how do, you, how do you deal with that sort of mm. reaction, this kind of techno-fetishism of the, of the prosthetic in a weird sort of way? It was shown in your music video. I think there was a, there's a line... Um, uh, there's a man actually in that music video who cuts off his own legs mm. and uh, you're shown the image, they believe in you, Victoria. And there's this kind of very visceral <laughs> image you show of, of prosthetic envy in action. Sure. We haven't well, luckily, got there yet, well, but luckily, how do you deal with it? Um, luckily, UK has a lot more uh, um, irony and <sighs> actually took that as not, not very seriously, whereas somewhere like in Russia, uh -huh. they were like, this is a real message. <laughs> you know, they kind of forgot that it was a pop music video and... Uh, <laughs> But, um, well, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I think that what is fascinating at the moment is that I think that the whole section of medical devices like prosthetics, et cetera, et cetera, or things that help you hear or see or whatever, I think that the interest in that field has reached its peak where the designers are coming in and before you know it like everything is starting to have a lot of design in it and then it's like at which point does it cross over into a consumer product and mm -hmm. not uh, a medical device anymore you know and i think that that's something that's uh, there was a um, uh, what's it called? The body hack recently on BBC Three with this guy called James, and he had this gaming company that sponsored this super crazy robot arm for him and stuff. And we had like a really long interview, and you know, and I kind of had to shatter a little bit of an illusion for him because he was like really thinking that this super robotic arm is really going to make him feel better about himself as a person, right? Now, the problem is, it just doesn't work that way. It is exactly the same as you'd go and buy a, an amazing expensive pair of shoes or a car or a phone or whatever it is that you're going to buy that's, that's kind of pimped and it's gonna be like, oh, I've got it in my pocket, it feel great, you know? So, and it, you know, and, and, and weirdly enough, um, you know, I do think that um, I personally draw a line between these things. Like in my day-to-day -day life, I absolutely couldn't care less about what my prosthetics is like because mm. if I'm walking, if I'm doing the things I need to do, I really don't care. You know, I'm exploring, you know, how much I can fuck with the body and where I can push it and what is possible in my performance time in order to sort of really ask a much bigger philosophical question and also how can I have fun and entertain and things like that, you know, but um, 
I think that um, I think that actually there is definitely massive increase um, in design in things that are supposed to be medical that is definitely changing it to another thing, which then. I mean, and I know we're not quite talking about, it, but we, we, we've had quite a few chats on the yeah. phone where it was like, you know, we're a design festival, but then there is quite a lot of stuff about prosthetics and disability and stuff, and how much do we talk about it? Is it relevant and stuff? But I think that one relevant point here is that uh, what I've been finding is that uh, where everything is going, like by traveling and seeing all the different inventors and people who are making stuff and designing stuff, I can't possibly see how in about 50 years time, the, um, how there'll be any difference between someone walking with devices on them that are for health and devices that are just simply there to enhance their function, like being able to navigate better or think or see through fucking walls or, mm. I don't know. So it kind of, um, I think that actually design is, is blurring a lot of lines between different technology and things that are actually being made. It's, just extension. It just reminds me, you texted me this morning and went, oh, do I wear one of the show limbs? Do you mind, are you easy either way? And I go, are you easy if I wear jeans or a suit jacket or a pants jacket? I mean, it's, it's a very odd um, Listen, I've had framing. requests. I've done shows where they were like, um, If it we doesn't light we, up, don't come. We, yeah, that, we no. thought she was going to light up. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I've changed my mind and I've decided not to light up today. <laughs> No, no glitter cannons. James, James shows me there's a wonderful online video of a prosthetic with a glitter cannon in it. And it was the most horrendous and most wonderful mm. thing at the same time. But the, the, when we had that discussion on the phone, you touched on this word of difference, differentiated experience. Uh, conversations mm. I've had with other individuals who are users and pilots of prosthetic limbs. It constantly comes back to this idea of difference. Body difference, limb difference, difference on a spectrum. So you can have the Neil Harbissons of the world, the cyborgs with the implants in their heads and they choose to be like that. The individuals who mm. choose to have ears surgically implanted into their arms. We, we can exist along that spectrum together. And I just wonder, from a design perspective, how do, you, how do you do three things with difference? How do you engineer it? How do you embrace it? And more importantly, which is what you do in your work, how do you encourage difference? Um, that's a really good point. I mean, it's kind of weird because I was, I was, I, I'm, I'm doing this event in, in LA in like a week's time and it's, it's like this sort of, they, they are looking at like uh, disability fashion and all kinds of weird stuff and I was just like having this conversation, I'm like, mm, you know, and I think everything comes down to the same thing is that it's like it, everything depends on your default position. It's like if you think that by default we're all the same and then there is these weird people over here that are like freaks and they don't belong and they're not like everybody else, etc. then you are naturally in that space. If you flip it over to the point where uh, actually everybody is completely different, I mean every single person is affected by their parents, everything that's happened to them, to medical things, to their taste in music. I mean, literally, you can't possibly, you know, it's like everyone's just so, so different. And, you know, and unfortunately, um, it's just not how society's built. Now, what's interesting with design stuff at the moment is that, like, when, when I take my trips to, like, MIT Media Lab and stuff, or, or some fab labs, and, and I'm, like, looking at what people are making, actually, a lot of inventors are uh, creating technologies in order to uh, make things that are specifically for that person. Like trying to, um, uh, like for example, there are some events about clothes or events about 3D printing. And the idea is, is that have like a mass market thing that can be completely individual. <laughs> and I do think that things are changing, but, um, it's very, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's, very it's, it's an illusion where 
People who think that they don't make fashion choices or design choices are deluded because all they're doing is they're, they're still picking something. They're just picking something that's considered not to be like a choice, like it's a mass, it's a mass choice, but it's still a choice. Uh -huh. So everyone still makes a difference, uh, makes a choice rather. And I, I want to talk, because I, I know we said in our, our call that we were going to focus a little bit on the Barnex world, but really this is a design festival and there's so many more elements to your, to your bow and the way in which you think about design and aesthetics of these three things, which are science and technology in the future. And I just wonder about your thinking around some of those concepts. And I just want to show one of your, your latest images, which is, which is this image here. And I know you said some of the feedback on images like this, uh, these very curated, futuristic science technology images. Oh, yeah, we talked about images. future images. Folks say, well, I think one of the feedback was, it felt like it should have existed for ages, is some of the feedback you get on things like that. What do you mean from that reaction? What does that reaction mean I to you? I don't know. I think it was really weird. It was somebody from a German newspaper where she saw some images and she saw some images from the prototype video. And she was like, oh, I feel like these, I, I should have already seen these and these should have been already out, but then they haven't been. And I think that... You know, and we, we talked about this briefly, it's like the whole concept of the future is that no person should really be able to sit there and predict it totally accurately because that would be so totally boring because you wouldn't possibly get to the point where you're surprised with a new design or a new concept where you're just like, oh my God, it feels like it should have totally been written in history, but it hasn't been yet, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, um, I don't know. It's, uh, it, it just makes me feel like it's going in the right direction. <laughs> well, well I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read some of the lyrics from your, your prototype mm. uh, piece, if you don't mind me. I'm sure you, you sure. read them much better than I do, but th this small, which I read as a poem, another life filled with parts, circuit board connected hearts, nostalgia for the future. We're playing God and now's the time. We're limitless, we're not confined. It's our future. And I just wonder if you could talk to those themes of the future. You, you've designed this aesthetic mm. and I'm, I'm gonna show some more of your, your images here. You, you've designed this aesthetic for the future that incredibly avoids being kind of kitsch or avoids being kind of retro futurist, at least to my eyes. Mm. And you, of course, you look at these images and you look at these ideas of the future and design and technology and you get this kind of very 80s vision of the future. What you've created is a 21st mm. century vision of the future. And I wonder what's boring. the process for that? Yeah, it's quite boring to Google the future stuff. <laughs> or like if you Google, I don't know, transhumanism or something. Yeah. It's like so it's, it's white someone old men. has yeah. It's like someone in their bedroom has already like fetishized and decided exactly the color scheme and the whole thing. And it's like this is what future looks like. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that the biggest thing that bugs me about the kind of the, the sort of eighties, nineties predictions of the future really is that somehow, you know, once technology is um, in a much bigger kind of collaboration with you as a human being and it's, you know, and, it, and perhaps it's like, uh, you know, you're very engaged with a lot of things that are kind of extending you, that somehow you lose centuries of what has made you human, of like love, poetry, uh, deepness, imagination, you know, all those amazing things and that kind of, that sort of, you know, that kind of feeling, that nostalgia, you know, and it's like, and, and that is probably for me has been the biggest misconception is that, you know, I think it, it is about elegantly extending yourself to the things that we are, you know, we are designing these things. We are creating um, the entire landscape that we live in and, and the, the new science and technology that we're creating isn't coming from the aliens, it's coming from us and our desires or feelings. So I think that uh, the kind of lack of personality in the future image that I think was very much portrayed 
in the 80s and the 90s is definitely something um, that I have an issue with. You know, it's like if you're, if you're a, a woman, then you're a robot and you're a sex robot and you're kind of like mean and tough. And, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's kind of like, I, I, think, that, um, I think that the prospect of how much deeper and weirder and more magical extending ourselves or our thoughts or our perceptions or our abilities with technology can actually be like that's the thing that really excites me you, you said something about collaboration with technology but i know all of these images are collaborations mm. with i mean you look at any of these images you send us these links with thousands of credits <laughs> all of these images are collaborations with multiple artists fashion mm. designers photographers and hackers and hackers. weird to no, what extent is collaboration very much at the core of your creative and design process? Um, massive. I literally don't think that I would have been able to do any of the things that I have if it wasn't for, like, for collaboration. And, you know, I think that it's possible for the occasional person out there to be like this genius with this incredible thing you know but i think that um i think that for me personally seeing that lack of connection between different fields is the reason why i keep bringing people together from so for example with these images in particular um it's like what i really wanted to do was to bring um art science technology together with pop culture and high fashion, right? And still somehow sort of feel coherent. And weirdly enough, there was definitely an icky p period where there was like 12 people on the team and you have some hackers and then you have some like uh, people that are sort of like coding all kinds of different stuff. And then you have high fashion people and a photographer and they were like so scared to speak to each other. Hmm. They were on the thread of an email and they're like, oh my God, but I bet they know nothing about fashion and design, right? And the people who were like bringing all the, all, all the uh, lights and, and sensors and stuff were like, oh my God, they must be really like, you know, literally we were referring to like um, Hollywood movies you know, like the kind of the cliche of how people are going to be. And it was hilarious because actually, actually in the end, when we got there, they all realized that everybody's just working with a different medium and everybody is trying to express something and it's not that different, you know? And I think that, um, I think, you know, it's definitely a personal mission of mine at the moment is to, to kind of create a tunnel between this like really exclusive smart world, you know, the world where everything's conceptual and the more kind of commercial world, because I don't actually think that, that they that particularly exclusive. And I don't think the kind of more modern, younger sort of society is quite that segregated. You know, majority of people you meet these days could have an appreciation for something a bit cheesy and you know things that you see on the TV and vice versa they can go to gallery and feel some depth you know so I wonder when working with technology how mm. you continue to maintain something very human and also very humane because we spoke mm. very briefly about sci-fi fetishism and how mm. everything has to end up being a dystopia eventually now you flirt with that a little but mm you do explore this very human side of technology and I wonder why that exists in your work and how are you trying to express that? Um, I think that, and this is kind of really weird because I do think that if, if, if I didn't quite go through such extremes of questioning sort of myself and and if I didn't go through so many hard experiences I do think that I would have just been like not looking for it and so I think also with a little bit of the work that I've done especially with the prototype video I think I managed to see the importance of or actually the difference 
in presenting something that is more uh, designed to be over here and and how important that connection is so so a good example is um last i think i think a month ago or something we did a performance at M uh, music tech fest which is kind of like a sort of a hackathon type thing where loads of people from all over the world come and everyone that's got to do with music and visuals and things and they kind of spend a week of just experimenting and seeing what new projects they can come up with and one of once I got there, the first thing that I realized that really bothered me was that like they'll come up with a new program or a new sound or a new sort of uh, device that can maybe play music by movement or whatever. And, and then it's just a demonstration. It's like, so I stand here and then I have a sensor in the wrist. So when I do this, you can see on the screen that this is what's happening. And I'm just like, but what does it actually mean, like, to me or to a person? What does it mean and how are you, how is it not absolutely useless unless you do something with it that actually, like, acts as a tool to tell a story or to communicate with someone or do something like that? So I think that that's kind of the mission and I don't feel like enough of that is being done mm. a lot of really wacky technology is being created at the moment but I think that it isn't always very effectively shown or incorporated into something that actually means something to you in your life properly so it's, it's almost how do you how do you actualize a live demo because we've all had some yeah. experience tech demos yeah. Uh, tech conferences and they are hellish experiences where they force a VR headset or whatever the technology is onto you and go, go have an experience. And the only experience you're having is like, Jesus, I'm being stared at by a bunch of guys <laughs> who are you know, trying to buy this, whatever the hell this headset is in horrible yeah. experiences. Definitely. And, and also, and even just especially from the design perspective, you know, like, um, you know, the, the Spike prosthetic leg was designed with a really clear feeling and a message and a purpose of what I wanted to express and how I wanted to feel and what I wanted someone else to feel. Mm -hmm. And of course, sometimes you can create design that just by looking at it, you just kind of feel really impressed. But I do think that if you manage to incorporate it into the actual story of something else, then it becomes much more powerful. That's kind of, that's just, that's just been the experience that I've had. So to talk about those guys who love their live demos. You are the director's <laughs> fellow at MIT Media Lab, which <laughs> strikes me as a place full of live, live demos. And I just wondered if you could speak to some of your collaborations with, with Hugh Hare and some of the work that you're doing there, because it's the side that we know least about. Woo! And I'm keen to unpick. Sure. Um, well, I've been a fellow there for like a year now and weirdly enough there's like there's been definitely a lot of just like arriving and just watching other people do a lot of amazing stuff yeah. and collecting it in your mind and thinking right what am I going to do with this information what am I going to do with this opportunity and we are finally uh, embarking on a new project and and it actually the reason why it took this long is because it, in my opinion, it needed to be a collaboration. So at the moment, the collaboration that I'm looking at is um, working with uh, the biomechatronics team at MIT Media Lab, which basically um, create uh, bionic limbs that have all kinds of motors and computers in them and stuff that actually, um, you know, probably the most sophisticated stuff that's out there. Um, so I've been working with Professor Hugh Her from there for a while now. We've been sort of plotting the right thing and trying to secure the right elements to build the stuff like we've just uh been given the green light to uh use the most sophisticated um implants that you put inside your muscle tiny little things that basically wirelessly can control anything primarily supposed to be for an external limb that would then 
pick up those signals. And um, But see, this is where the cyborg thing, this is where I had an issue with, because we were like, right, let's get these implants and make you a bionic leg. And then I was like, but why? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, why? What, just so I can sort of like sit there and like move my foot better? I'm like, what will I actually really do? You know, like for someone else that's really uh, important, for me, it didn't really feel like it was that important. And, you know, for, for a perspective of medical breakthrough, yes, but still to me as an individual, it still made no sense. So as the time went on, we now have um, almost certainly, but can't be 100% sure, we now hmm. have Neri Oxman on board, who is a designer out of this world, who works with biology and who works with, who's invented a glass 3D printer and she's absolutely insane. So we now, I'm like, okay, so we have a very organic design based person and now we have mechatronics and mechanical device stuff. Now let's create a narrative and a story. What are we going to make? So that's kind of where it's at. So it's still an experiment. You know, Music Tech Fest event was an experiment. You know, is it really worthwhile getting 13 different people who make totally different things with sensors, with neuroscientists, with um, projection mappings, with coders, with musicians? Is it worth getting them all into one room and creating an orchestra out of them? I kind of came to the conclusion that it was, but it still needs more developing and stuff. But, you know, I think the point is, I think the future needs to be collaborative and I think the future needs to be more human and, but kind of, you know, just, enough of that kind of separate attitude, like this is technology and this is AI and this is me, you know, it's, I think that, you know, it's, everything is much more connected than that. And despite the work you've done with technology mm. and wetware, hardware, software, mm. it still comes back to one core thing, which is your music practice. Mm. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the new album, which is, which is Counterflow, which is mm. just here. How has music been key for you thinking about both science, technology, but most importantly, the future. How have you mm. used that medium and designed through that medium? Well, it's weird with this particular album, it was like, let's create some music that's like a soundtrack to what I'm doing. I mean, you know, there's definitely things that have varied throughout the years of like wanting to maybe you know, oh, let's make a track that's good for live performances or maybe radio, whatever else. But, but this time round, you know, it was very much like, I mean, even the title Counterflow itself, you know, I, I just tried to basically, with all my experience in music that I've had, I just tried to put together um, an album that, a mini album that just encompassed sort of themes and vibes and sounds and feelings that I've sort of picked up and so the music has always kind of been a bit of a, a car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the wheels that, I'm, that are driving me to do all the other things, you know? So it's, but it's, it's I think, like I'm already on the next project, so my mind is already. <laughs> but do check it out, it's quite fun. So finally, we have, we have some time for audience questions. So we do have some, I think we've got some mics that we're gonna run. If you could wait until the mic gets to you, just so we can, um, we're recording this, uh, I hope that's not an issue for anybody here in the audience. Um, any questions at all? We're going to run a mic. Wow, we've answered everything. <laughs> there must be a Maybe question. Maybe they're just shy. Yeah, you have a question. So I have to think about my question. How to formulate it uh, correctly. Um, I'm the founder of a company that uses virtual reality for physical rehab. Uh, in particular for people with quite severe, um, initially upper limb disabilities, and I was wondering whether you could uh, just tell me a bit about your views on that point, also because you had a disability, so mm -hmm. have, you have the prosthetic, so. Um, great question. Actually, there is um, definitely a lot of conversation ongoing at the moment about using virtual reality for rehabilitation for all kinds of things. Um, 
I mean, the other month I was uh, at a conference where they were talking about using um, virtual reality for um, uh, treatment of paedophiles, which was absolutely crazy. But I think the reality is, is that you can definitely do that. And I, I personally think that, um, I personally think that it's definitely an area that needs to be explored 100% because some, you know, some of the more, most latest technology is so powerful and interactive that it's, um, it's absolutely a yes, for sure. Any other questions at all? Oh, these guys can see. Hi. <laughs> well, I'd like to start off by saying I love what I've seen here. It's absolutely beautiful work. But there was a comment that you brought up about uh, the fetishization of artificial limbs. And something that I've noticed while kind of looking at this is that on one side you do have these films and these pieces of artwork which really make them look beautiful and make them these things that even people without the need for amputation actually feel like, mm -hmm. oh, I actually quite like that. And then on the other hand, you've got the very medical, clinical side of things. But what I don't see a lot of is what you were talking about, about having a having your own response to it in terms of something that is relatable and something that's part of identity. It seems that at the moment there, seem, there is this binary of it's either incredibly beautiful and slick and polished and fashionable or it's incredibly clinical. And I was wondering if you'd ever done many projects where the end result was more in the middle, that it was more about the personal experience of um, losing a limb or having to deal with um, having to get an artificial one. Um. So, one of the reasons why not that much of that is seen around is actually because pretty much you have sports and the Paralympians, and then you have, um, I don't know, perhaps a couple of those sports people that are maybe like doing um, sort of strictly come dancing time shows and, and etc. And then you have Amy Mullins and uh, couple of professors but pretty much the reality is that there is absolutely nothing that exists in between at the moment now in in regards to whether whether that is something that I would like to do the answer would be no because I feel that as the bridge as the gap is closing between the sportsman and the potential couple of celebrities that are out here with prosthetic limbs and there's absolutely nothing in between there's no media visibility there's nothing happening i believe that um it's just a matter of time until that starts to happen and until you know we actually start seeing people with prosthetic limbs not uh you know just going about normal things and perhaps documenting their story in, in a completely different way i think for me as an artist um and kind of after having such a long time to have fought for uh, uh obtaining my my sort of uh, prosthetic limbs i definitely feel like you know my time is better spent exploring the things that are out there and are really hard and more conceptual just personally. <laughs> I hope that answers it. You, you spoke about James very briefly, but one of the feedback that James gets whenever he meets somebody, uh, he's obviously missing uh, one uh, leg and his arm, mm. and people come up to him, the first thing they ask is, so what sport do you play? Yeah. And is there, is there an issue of perception that we have in the general public? Mm. Yeah. For every individual like yourself who's standing on stage mm. and and presenting these beautiful images for mm. every individual like James, for every individual like Nigel Ackland, mm. the user of the B-Bionic. There's a, also a hidden group of folks who never get that sort of presence. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there is definitely a thing between, um, you can go from uh, an ill, uh, disabled person to a superhero in like a flash at the mm. moment, and there's nothing really in between. Um, and, and, and I do think that it is just simply because there's just not been enough time and spotlight on this to happen properly. You know, a, a good example is um, if you think about the film industry, for example, you, you know, at the beginning of the film industry, um, um, a person of 
colour would only get uh, a role in a film if they were like, hi there, we've got a role of um, uh, a slave or a butler, and you're like, oh, okay, all right, well, I better go and do that, you know? And this is where it's like, if you're like an amputee at the moment, it's like you just, um, you go, we, we have a role for you. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. So, you know, it just puts it in timeline of like how, where it's at. Uh, but I do think that someone has to do the weird superhero art stuff that, you know, to kind of set some start and end points, I think. Now, there is a friend of mine, Angel, who's, uh, she's a congenital amputee and she gets called for roles. She's an actress, she gets called for roles where they need a disabled individual. She's like, well, why can't I play roles for <laughs> well, able-bodied individuals? <laughs> But with, with some of her limbs, she, she potentially yeah. can as well. Yeah, I mean, it? it's, um, I, I don't know, I, like, like well, I said. Why does that character, why does the story, mm. why does mm. the individual have yeah. to be, it's a contested word, but disabled is the word that's used. And I know you have strong opinions on that word. I just don't believe in it. Right. I, just, yeah. I just really don't believe in it because I think that, um, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's something that's kind of very old and it's, it's not relevant properly anymore. And I think that it will be very, very different very soon. But, um, but I do think that, um, I think that weirdly enough, there is, for the first time ever, there is this massive opportunity for design and technology to completely remarket what it means to be sort of helped and extended and aided or whatever you want with, with, with the design and technology if you're at the moment considered disabled because I think for the first time it can be generally something positive it can be generally something that's cool and exciting and um it's yeah i think it's a really good time for that and the nigel act from the the pilot for the b barnick limb mm -hmm. always says when anyone comes up to him and says uh, are, are you disabled he the first thing out of his mouth is goes who are you to diss my ability before turning his wrist 360 <laughs> degrees that's his his specific way um yeah yeah but um yeah so i don't know any more questions or? Yeah. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's probably like a, th there isn't like a superpower that I'm wishing for every day, if that makes sense. You know, like day to day superpowers, like being able to look at someone and know what they're thinking and yeah, just usual stuff. <laughs> that, that question should be fed into every single fireside chat ever, no matter who the panelist is. That's a wonderful question. Any, any final questions at all? Please. Uh, I'd really like to comment about uh, society being, you know, about everybody being different rather than the assumption that everybody's the same with a few exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really relevant to fashion and young girls growing up and body image and issues like that. Do you see that you maybe have a role in celebrating that everybody is different? Um, or is that not your? Yeah, um, weirdly enough, I was having this chat with um, this organization uh, last night. There was this big event in Los Angeles happening in a few weeks that is quite international and it is about sort of looking at the whole industry of like fashion with that's got to do with every kind of disability and it was funny because we were talking about it and I'm like I'm like first of all it's like trying to create fashion for the most unfashionable term in the world and I don't think that what actually uh, is currently considered a constituency of disabled people is is you know not worth talking about what is not worth talking about is this old wording and 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 it's like trying to remarket something that is like you know you're just like how am I going to do that you know but then weirdly enough they were talking about issues with fashion and design and then I'm like yeah but I'm like is that not actually the same when you go into like any normal mainstream fashion I'm like the amount of people who don't really voice their opinion who go to the shop and are constantly faced with stuff that never fits them. And we're not talking about sort of like if you're in a wheelchair and if you're like have a specific body shape, we're talking about, 
you know, normal like men and women who just happen to have larger breasts or extra tall or something is going on. You know, it's like, it, you know, it's it's the same. It's it's um, there's definitely an issue with it for sure. And you know, and I, I but it, it is nice to see that there are actually a lot of people working on trying to change that. But it's going to be it's slug. <laughs> it's quite it's quite it's quite a process. I uh, wonder if there's any more questions. Could you tell a bit more about the creative process when you collaborate um, with, you said, like hackers and people who work with sound and designers? Do you all get together or to create, like, from your uh, imagination into the reality? How is the process there? Yeah, well, I think that. Um I mean, as going from your last question about about clothes, really, I think that um, one thing that sort of bothers me sometimes is that if you look at anything, like let's say it's a photo shoot or a performance, that I, I, I kind of really just dislike segregation of skills and tools and things that make you feel things. And I kind of feel like, for example, creating... Um, an outfit that perhaps has so many different qualities where it might be reacting to your body, it might be reacting to the environment, um, it might have different functions of expressing sound and taking in data from you or whatever, you know. It just becomes so much more interesting. Why would you just have something that's one dimensional? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's like, it's like our imagination is so like vast and then so whenever I see anything that's too kind of like static I'm like why not make it more complicated <laughs> because it's you know it would be more more honest to, to how we really are I think. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing how you curate your collaborators how do you bring them together <laughs> such a wide subset of individuals for every project that you do? Um, I usually send a lot of really nice sweet yeah. emails hoping not to offend anyone that because like I know what I'm talking about because often you know I speak to people that are much more uh, traditionally more educated than myself and I have to kind of be like well I have this idea and maybe we could do this um, but I think that um, it's I think the biggest thing is that you know I never try to be an expert in anything my 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 theory is is that is to do the right uh, casting and the right picking of the people so that by the time they get into the situation they can do exactly what drives them but it becomes exactly the thing that is needed for the thing well, this, is, this is an audience full of <clears throat> people interested in design and working in design is there anything you're looking for right now in terms of the collaboration is there anything that's sparked your interest um oh my god that would be really boring if I knew that. Like, it's my, it's like the best day in my life is when I just wake up and I log into my computer and this wackiest email comes through yeah. and I'm like, yes. I'm like, I've been waiting for that. I didn't know about it, but I have been waiting for it. So I don't know, I, but I mean, it's like, you know, it's like if anything clicked with anyone, that's, you know, that's enough. I think it's like an instinctual thing. So as soon as this finishes, you're going to be hit by a barrage of live demos. <laughs> Trust me. Um, we've probably got time for just one more question. If there's anyone with a burning question, please, this gentleman here. Hi. Um, so you talked about that some people call it disability having a perspective, but I, you, we see in many media says actually it becomes an ability. Like for example. I just think about iRobot now where Will Smith has this mechanical arm and actually in some sense weaponizes it. Now when we see your very pointy prosthetic, uh, prosthetic for example, um, some people could see it as almost weaponizing as well. And I was wondering, <laughs> do you ever have like, would you be able to walk with the, around that every day or would there be something like legal like legal actions behind like or do you sometimes have to deal with something like that? Mm, good point i have definitely been told not to participate 
in a few scenes because it would damage the floor. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I think, you know, I, I'm, I, m my personal opinion is with, with regards to uh, sort of design and fashion and prosthetics and anything that kind of is an extra is, you know, I never want to do a sort of, um, I never want to wear anything that is there for no reason. You know, I don't want to show up in a meat dress. I want to kind of measure the level of impact that needs to happen, you know. So for me personally, most impact usually happens on stage when I feel like, you know, it gets the correct level of focus, I think. But um, I mean, you know, ev like everything will be exploited to bad and good causes. So, um, you know, should we not look into extending ourselves and making ourselves more powerful <laughs> with technology just because someone might do something bad with it? I don't know. It's, um, it's an ethical question for someone else. I want to steal the final question. So the thing that's very clear to me is that in every single piece of your practice, you're creating your own future or your own fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, what are the tools that you'd give an audience such as this to create and go and create their own fantasies or their own uh, futures, their own fictions? What are some of the tools and subsets? Um, I think the biggest one is not to underestimate curiosity. Like, that's how everything starts for me and that's how everything continues driving for me is to is to remain continuously curious and how to do something how to feel something how to figure something out or whatever that that's definitely like everything and and actually just not be afraid of anything <laughs> not be afraid of anything that's right but yeah no curiosity does not kill the cat i challenge that but weaponized prosthetics might. <laughs> so on that note, stay curious, um, embrace, engineer, and encourage difference. I just want to thank the Victoria and Albert Museum for hosting us this afternoon, to Irene, if she's around the digital curator who allowed us to make this happen. And I want to end with this, which is exactly how we end all of our virtual futures salons. And that's with this little sermon. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem inevitable or imminent never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I know, Victoria, does that. I hope you feel you've done that today. I Thank just you want coming. you to join me in thanking Victoria Modesta. Thank you.